So now we've, we, we, we've reached the final award of the afternoon, the coveted recording of the year, awarded by our jury to the recording that they considered to be the very finest of the reader-voted winners. And to present the recording of the year, um, we're absolutely delighted to welcome on stage uh, someone that some of us are pleased to see back at the BBC, despite um, the fact that, as a consequence, he's had to leave the Royal Opera House. Please welcome Tony Hall, Lord Hall. <laughs> Um, I'm thrilled to be here and to escape from Broadcasting House on day eight for just over an hour or so. Do not read anything into that other than uh, a complete commitment to uh, these awards, BBC Music Magazine and the BBC in Music. And, and I think, you know, music to the BBC is absolutely an essential part of our DNA. And it's brilliant to hear uh, the person who came to collect the award on behalf of the Berlin Philharmonic to come up here and say how important the BBC is and how important music is to the BBC. Well, that's a challenge for all of us. It's a challenge to me, and thank you for saying that. It really meant a lot. Thank you. But, but the other reason why I'm thrilled to be here uh, is because uh, this award is going to someone who when I was at the Royal Opera House, uh, had a very, very special part in my life in the Royal Opera House's uh, life. Uh, the Opera House loves having him um, around. Uh, he took on a starry role last year um, in a programme we did to explain how um, uh, uh, the complexities of conducting opera, and uh, you know, there are risks involved in that, but actually the commitment to saying we want to show how this art form is pulled together and explain that to people and excite people uh, is the sort of person uh, that he is. Um, it's wonderful seeing his orchestra and chorus grow and grow and grow in terms of prominence and ambition, and it's fabulous that this award is going to a recording um, of something that has been previously uh, neglected. I think that's also a mark of, uh, of the, the person, no pun. Um, and it had a very powerful proms performance last year that thrilled audiences. So, I'm extremely pleased to announce, delighted to announce, that the winner of the 2013 Recording of the Year is Sir Mark Elder and the Halley Orchestra and Choir's recording of Elgar's The Apostles. This is an enormous pleasure. It really is something so special. And I know that my friends and colleagues in Manchester will be thrilled when they hear this amazing extra news. To, to have the Choral Award was really unexpected and delightful. And this is, well, it's just marvellous. I think that uh, when I first went to Manchester 13 years ago, I said to the orchestra, I want us to be, which is a little outrageous on me, but I thought, you know, you might as well start uh, as high as you can. <laughs> I want us to be the best orchestra for British music in the world, and I want us to look at Elgar and everything that he did. And I said that at the time because I felt this music so strongly myself, and I felt that the Halle had perhaps, through obvious and perfectly understandable reasons, lost that connection. And I felt it was a good thing to do. But I had no idea what this would develop into. Uh, this man was so an amazingly important man for our musical life. And he's so easily misconstrued because of that enormous moustache, isn't he? You know. Um, and we all know now that behind that moustache there was something of such nervous, um, lacking in confidence, neurosis. And he never knew whether or not his music would be appreciated, applauded, day by day. And to spend these, it's actually 12 years now, thinking about his music and playing it and playing it and playing it and then recording it is a really wonderful way to understand something about him. And I hope that generations to come will find something in his music. I hope that his music will still play a part in our lives. And as I've mentioned already, The Apostles is not an easy work. It's incredibly difficult to perform well for all of us. 
the singers, the, the orchestra, me, certainly. And one of the aspects about this recording that I, I treasure, and I always will, is the fact that it's a reflection of our hall in Manchester. And I'm, I know, many of you know, this wonderful hall, the Bridgewater Hall, and it does have an acoustic that suits this music so well. But we all owe a great deal of thanks to Stephen Portnoy, who is our quite remarkable balancer and technician on these projects that we do live. The recording is a reflection of one performance with three days of rehearsals. And his ability to somehow capture what I'm trying to do in the hall is very special. And I'm very proud of my orchestra. They are a wonderful group of musicians. Um, one of their qualities, you know, is that they never show me whether or not they like the music that we're doing. <laughs> And sometimes I go up and say to them, you know, this is so marvellous, isn't it? I'm, when we were doing Goethe Demerung, I remember saying to one of my leading wind players, God, it's so beautiful to hear this in this hall, isn't it? I mean, you all sound just marvellous. She said, hmm, I prefer Palestrina myself. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a quality in an orchestra that when you're making music together, that you will, that you will just make the music the most important thing in the space. And I think that this performance was taxing for us because none of us knew it. We had no idea how it would all come together. And the cast, uh, some of them had never done it before, some of them had, didn't like the piece. I remember a lot of them were very, very skeptical about it. And there's one aspect about it that he makes some very unusual demands on everybody, you know, Elgar in this piece. It has to do with the dramatic, the story, you know, that he's telling. And soon after the beginning, there's a Jerusalem dawn Perhaps, I'm not quite sure that it really is a dawn, but some blazing power comes out of him. And it features that scene, as I know many of you will remember, the shofar. And uh, there's a letter from Elgar, you know, about the shofar to my great predecessor, uh, Hans Richter. And he said he's been warmly told by somebody who knows that, of course, you can't use a real shofar because they, don't, they can't be played in tune. I mean, it's just a, a terrible noise. Uh, so it's got to be done on a ceremonial trumpet. And uh, my revered friend and colleague, John Summers, was very adamant that I should take this letter seriously. But when we booked a shofar player, I spoke to him. There are a few. And, and it, it, I don't know whether you all know, but it's a sort of a temple trumpet, a Jewish temple trumpet, and it's still used all the time in, in the synagogue. And it has the most fantastic power uh, a most fantastic attack. It does not sound like any orchestral instrument. And in that wonderful film that John Bridcott made about Elgar, um, there's a player playing it. So I was looking forward to a ram's horn, ladies and gentlemen, you know, a ram's horn. I mean, the, what, a ram's horn's a ram's horn, and it makes this incredible noise. And when I spoke to the gentleman who'd been hired to play the shofar, he said, oh, no, he said, no, you can't use one of those. You get those in, in tourist shops. They're, they're completely inappropriate. Oh, no, I've got something quite different. And so when he turned up, we were all agog to see what actually his shofar would look like. Well, it was, I mean, for those of you who still remember the term Heath Robinson, it would be entirely applicable. I mean, this, this strange, self-made, long sort of thing came sticking out into the horn, into the hall, and he made the most incredible noise on it. We had to warn the people sitting near him that, that they may suffer from heart attacks. And it, to me, it was completely thrilling, because it didn't sound like anything else. And that's something that no one associates with Elgar. You always expect it to sound like something you know and you recognize. And I think there is in the spirit of the apostles something new, something that needed to come out, something that perhaps hadn't been heard before, and I hope that what we've done is to bring this work in all its beauty, in all its mysticism, its ecstasy, uh, bring it to people in a way that perhaps hasn't been possible before. But I've been so helped by my colleagues in Manchester, by our wonderful choir, our children's choir, who performed so beautifully at the end, those wonderful hallelujahs that sit along the top of the final ensemble, and my orchestra and the cast. And thank you to all the readers of BBC Music Magazine for your belief in what we've done. Thank you for being here today, some of you, to support this venture. And thank you for believing in the future of recorded music, which is, in a way, what this is all about. And I'm thrilled that we should play, this year, such a big part in it. Thank you. Thank you.